Good day, everyone. Welcome back to our show. I pray that God will give us wisdom once again to have a productive learning experience here at Vet Talks with Doc Athena. Good morning. Today we are going to discuss internal parasites of ruminants focusing on fecal egg worms. This is a guide for animal raisers, students of veterinary medicine and animal science, and basically anyone who is interested in this topic. Here is a photo from researchgate.net showing us the fecal eggs under the microscope. The fecal eggs presented on this photo are called strongyl type eggs. This strongyl type are thin, smooth shell containing anything from eight cells to larvae. So again, we will be focusing on the fecal worm eggs of internal parasites of ruminants. There will be five internal parasites of ruminants that we will be discussing and i would like to thank our source of photos for this particular lecture intervet thank you for this images a guide to internal parasites of ruminants including their relative sizes However, of course, it depends on the microscope that you're using, but for an ordinary light microscope, you might see the one that I showed you a while ago. But there are some characteristics of some eggs that will indicate or that will tell us what type of egg is it and from which parasite it came from. Later, we will discuss this. But for now, let me give you an overview. So we will be discussing roundworms or nematodes flukes or flatworms, also called as trematodes, tapeworms, also called as cestodes, and also lungworms and coccygia. This lecture series will be divided into two parts. For the first lecture, we will be discussing the roundworms or nematodes and the flukes or flatworms or trematodes. Roundworms or nematodes would include the stomach worms or abomasal worms, the small intestinal worms, and large intestinal worms. Let's discuss first about roundworms. Roundworms are also called as nematodes or helminths. That's why most of our dewormers are also called anthelmintics. These are the most common internal parasites of ruminants, and they are also the most economically devastating. Most of them, if not all, are voracious blood suckers, destroying the lining of the stomach or intestines to access the bloodstream. And they usually cause colic or abdominal pain, diarrhea, anemia, and weight loss due to the animal's inability to digest feed completely. Because of this inability, it also affects the performance of the animals, resulting to poor feed efficiency, reduced milk production, and reproductive inefficiency. For roundworms in this lecture, we will be discussing the parasites based on their predilection site. And we have abomasal or stomach worms, small intestinal worms, and large intestinal worms. For abomasal or stomach worms, they can be further categorized into three. We have the Haemonchus species or the barber's pole worm, or the large stomach worm. It is also called as wire worm. And males could be up to 18 millimeters long, while females could be up to 30 millimeters long. 
That's why they are called as large stomach worm. Haemonchus or barber's pole worm is really the biggest problem of goats when it comes to internal parasitism. Next, stomach worms or abomasal worms of ruminants is the Ostertagia species. These are medium or brown stomach worm which could be 6 to 9 millimeters long and they can invade the animal's immune system especially with mature cows near parturition so you have to be careful or you could conduct phycolysis prior to the expected delivery date of your cows that's why the worming is usually recommended before the breeding season or sometimes before the expected due date. Or sometimes you may ask your veterinarian for your herd health program in your farm to check for the worming or to include the worming before parturition or expected due date. Because there are some animals also that could do transplacental transmission or they could pass through the placenta and could be transmitted to the young before the animal is born. Next would be Trichostrongylus species and they are called also as a small stomach worm with length of approximately 5 millimeters. So you can see on the right on this slide the fecal egg worms of Haemonchus or Barber's pole worm and the Ostertagia or the brown stomach worm as well as the Trichostrongylus or the bankrupt worms. And I would like to thank Intervet for these presentations or images of our fecal eggs of the internal parasites of ruminants. Just a short break, folks. Did you learn something so far? If yes, please give us a thumbs up. And if you have any questions, clarifications, or anything related to this lecture video, please comment it below. Are you enjoying this free lecture? If yes, please consider subscribing in our YouTube channel and follow us on Docathena Facebook page because through the page, we could communicate better. I do my best to reply to all your comments here in YouTube, but if you want a better communication, then please do follow our Facebook page so that we can have a better form of communication. That's for a short break. Now let's go back to work. Now let's discuss small intestinal worms. So they are found basically in the small intestine. We have Cooperia species or a small intestinal worm. There's also Nematodirus species or twisted wire worm. Bonostomum species and Gygeria species which are hookworms. Strongyloides or intestinal threadworm and Toxocara species also called as Ascarid worm. You can see the photos on the right for their relative sizes and how they actually look like under the microscope. Most of it are actually strongyl type. During my thesis days for the phycolysis part of my study, I basically just identified them as strongyl type of fecal egg worms. Now let's look at uh, large intestinal worms. There's Ovesophagostomum species or nodular worm, Schubertia species or large mouth bowel worm, Trichuris species or whip worms, and Scarbinema species or pinworms. Also, some of them photo on the right. Our source just provided us limited photos of fecal eggs. So thank you again, Intervet, for these photos. So that's it for our small and large intestinal worms. Now let's look at some of the other parasites that we should be taking note of 
First of all, I would like to thank Lynn Nutt and Eileen Elliott for showing us or for sharing a photo of a nematode, strongyle type egg. And as you can see, uh, first they have cells and then it will mature until it will have a larvae inside of it. That's why if you watched our video for fecal egg collection from farm to the laboratory, I mentioned there that you have to keep your fecal pellets or the fecal egg samples in a cool place during your transport. That is to prevent the hatching of eggs because once the larvae leave the egg, then we might not be able to get an accurate result in the lab because the fecal egg count might decrease because the eggs already hatch and the larvae are already gone. So uh, please keep the fecal eggs uh, in a cold storage when transporting them from the farm to the laboratory, especially if the travel or distance would take some time. So let's look at Mesistocerus digitatus. This is a large worm up to 40 millimeter long, usually seen in tropical countries. So this is very important for us in the Philippines since we are a tropical country. Mesistocerus digitatus is one of the stomach worms of ruminants and that is 40, about 40 millimeters long. Next is the Haemonchus species and Bunostomum species, which are also called as warm weather parasites, causing severe blood loss and of course eventually anemia. Again, this is of importance to us in the Philippines and other warm uh, countries. Haemonchus and as I have mentioned, Haemonchus contortus is the biggest problem in goats, or it is also called as barber's pole worm. Next is Caecuria pacicellus, which is the most pathogenic hookworms. So these are voracious blood suckers, therefore causing anemia again. And Toxocara vitolorum, also known as Neoscaris vitolorum, which affects water buffaloes and other bovids. So why do I emphasize about the anemic effect, the blood loss and anemia caused by these voracious blood sucker parasites? Because if you watched our video for strategic worm control, I mentioned there that one of the things that we have to do before giving the wormers to our animals is that we have to do we have to do FEC or fecal egg count and PCV or packed cell volume. As mentioned there, packed cell volume give us an indication about the red blood cell level of our animals. It is different from the exact RBC count, but the PCV is a percentage of red blood cells relative to the whole blood that was submitted to the lab. So it gives us an indication if the animal is really anemic, while the FEC or the fecal egg count give us an indication of the possible worm load of the animal. Okay, so that's it for roundworms. Now let's discuss flukes or flatworms. They are also called trematodes. Included in this type of parasite are the fasciola species or liver flukes and paramphistomum species or stomach flukes. These fecal eggs from fasciola and paramphistomum has a distinct operculum on one pole of the fecal worm egg and this species usually require an intermediate host, and that is snails. Why intermediate host? Because this parasite requires two hosts to finish its life cycle, and that would be the ruminants, which are the definitive hosts, and the snails, which are the intermediate hosts. 
what is the importance of these flukes or flatworms or trematodes in our ruminants? They are also commonly reported in the Philippines and this is what usually happens. The adult flukes are found in the bile ducts of the definitive hosts, which are the ruminants, and the eggs are laid in the ducts and expelled with the feces. So the eggs hatch and the larva infects the snail where asexual reproduction occurs. The specific stages of the juvenile fluke leave the snail and insist on aquatic vegetation. So infection of cattle and other ruminants occurs when they eat the vegetation. The fluke then migrates to the liver and infects the bile duct and matures into an adult. What is so distinct is that the adult flukes burrow tunnels in the liver. And of course, that is an invasion. Hence, the body tries to repair the damages. That is normal process of healing. But as the body tries to repair the damages, there is the occurrence of scar tissues. And of course, if there are already scar tissues, then the liver loses part of normal function because the scars are already non-functional. And one of these functions include blood filtering. Therefore, there's an accumulation of blood toxins and waste products causing severe organ damage, including the brain. So that's it for flukes or flatworms, also called as trematodes. So let's look at the photos. As you can see, there is operculum. These are photos of fasciola. It presents operculum on one side of the fecal egg. I would like to thank our source, Janssen Animal Health. Thank you for sharing these images of fasciola fecal eggs. So that's it for the internal parasites of ruminants. For references, I would like to thank Claire and Jarosan and Troy Brick, Robert Corwin and Richard Rendell, as well as Mark Fox, Shane Gadberry et al., John Gillard, and Aurora Villarwell. Thank you very much for sharing all the information from your outputs. For summary, these are the most common internal parasites of ruminants, the roundworms or nematodes, flukes or flatworms, and also called as trematodes, tapeworms also called as cestodes, the lungworms, and coccygia. Internal worm infections usually cause battle jaw, especially with stomach worms and liver flukes. So this is a condition where animals have fluctuant swelling under the jaw from the accumulation of fluid or also known as submandibular edema. So sometimes it can spread to under the abdomen. And it is very important that before you give the wormers, please do conduct or please do submit fecal eggs for fecalysis because there's no dewormer that could kill all the worms. So for example, if what they saw in the lab are tapeworms, the vet would probably prescribe praziquantel, or there are other dewormers that might be more effective on certain parasitic load of your animals. That's why fecalysis is very important, especially in considering the effectivity of certain drugs. Also, when you do the worming, Please ask your veterinarian for rotation of the wormers to prevent anthelmintic resistance in your herd or in your farm. So that's it for the discussion of our internal parasites of ruminants focusing on the fecal egg worms. That's all, folks. I hope you learned something from this lecture video. Thank you very much. Please take care, everyone. God bless us all. And I hope to see you again soon. Bye! Thank you for being with us in this episode of Vet Talks with Doc Athena. 
For those who have not yet subscribed our YouTube channel, please do so. Did you learn something from this lecture? If yes, please hit the like button. If you want to be a part of our social media community and always updated of our new posts or to talk to me directly, you may do so by following our Facebook page, Twitter, and Instagram accounts. Again, thank you very much. Please keep safe everyone. God bless us all and I hope to see you again in our next lecture. This is Doc Athena, your country vet.